Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Tina Dorch, and uh, I manage the state of Nevada's Office of Minority Health and Equity. Uh, we refer to ourselves as NOMI. And I just want to kind of, you know, identify some of the obvious that's going on today, and that is that life happens. Um, we have a few panelists who have had a few last minute challenges. And as a result of that, we're going to enjoy a really personal experience tonight. Um, we're going to have a chance to really get to know one another and really just have a conversation. Um, we think that conversation is going to be very fruitful. Um, um, so because we're going to have an experience that is a little bit more personal, I wanted to give anybody who's interested in just identifying yourself, saying hello, um, an opportunity to do so. Um, and I just ask if you want to, if you're a guest, if you're not one of our panelists or presenters, if you're a guest and you want to say hello, it's totally optional. But I'll give it a few minutes. Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, you can or cannot, if you wish not to, come off of camera. But just, just give it a few minutes. Would anybody like to say hello? If you're a student, maybe tell us what school you go to. Uh, yeah, sure. I can start. Um, so my name is Dana Tontino. Um, you guys can call me Nate, though. Um, I go to Western High School. Um, I'm a sophomore. I'm 16. And I am a trans mask person and yeah nice to meet you nate nice to meet you too anybody else any other brave souls want to come out and say hi tell us about um, your i'm wilbur i'm wilbur sanders i use he him i'm trans mask and i go to von tobel and i'm in the eighth grade wilbur it's nice to meet you thank you I don't see anybody else want to say hello. Can you I'll say hello. And who's Hi, saying hello? Steven. Hi, Stephen. Um, I, I appear to be the oldest person here. I'm 71 and uh, been gay for 71 years. Um, I when I, I haven't really been paying attention to what gay people have been doing for a while. I'm looking at all these symbols. Someone was talking about their trans mass or something. I don't even know what that is. Uh, I so I feel I, I feel like I'm going to get some education here because I just haven't really been paying attention. I've been off elsewhere in my life. I'm married, and my husband is making dinner right now. So lucky um, you. Yeah. 20 years. We've been together 20 years this year. And should we say Stephen or Steve? I didn't hear Steven. that. At the very Stephen is good. All right. Well, I think that the learning curve is going to go both ways, Stephen, tonight. So I'm looking forward to that. And anybody else? I could do an introduction as well. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Tina. Uh, my name is Daniel Dabrowski, he, him. Uh, I am currently the senior warden at All Saints Episcopal Church. So I'm here today representing All Saints and I'm also here just representing my own personal interests. Uh, I am 35 years old. Um, I am also an openly gay man. Um, I have served in various youth communities over the years. I used to be a case manager at a homeless shelter for runaway youth. I was a uh, assistant manager at a uh, group home for teens with behavioral issues for a number of years as well. And I used to run a youth support group when I lived in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I've been out of that for a while now. Uh, I used to be in the Air Force. I'm an Air Force veteran now and a construction manager for the Air Force. And just trying to reconnect with the LGBTQ community and see what All Saints can do to help support and make some connections grow. Daniel, we're so glad that you're here. Me in particular, because guess what? I'm from Detroit. So you win the prize tonight for being my favorite egg in the carton. Awesome. I'm off to a good start. <laughs> we got favoritism over here. <laughs> well, I say it right now, though, Nate. Remember, that could change. I'm very fickle. Of course, of course. <laughs> Anybody else? I could go. Hello, everyone. My name is Mario Woolfolk. I am a community health worker with Silver State Equality uh, here in Las Vegas. And I'm here because we are 
looking to start working with youth. So I thought this would be a good learning opportunity for me to get some uh, insight into folks who's already doing the work and just for my own personal growth because I'm new to the field of community health work. Mario, you are now running a close second in my favorite ed contest. <laughs> um, we have a very soft spot for community health workers, number one. And number, the work that you do is amazing and that you come from your community is just something we just appreciate. But also Silver State, you just mentioned Silver State uh, Equality. Mm -hmm. Andre Wade is a recent board member from my advisory committee. And I now recognize your name. Now yes. I put a name with, I've heard of you. Yes. I've just never met you. Nice to so meet very you, nice yeah. to make your you acquaintance. Yes. Nice to make your acquaintance. Thank you, same to you. Anybody else want to say hello again? You don't have to at all. I think that might be it. I see somebody else that I have a very strong um, affinity for, Miss Linda Anderson. I think that's Ms. the same Miss Linda Anderson, but um, we're going to go ahead and just keep moving through our agenda. And uh, as part of my opening remarks, I just want to tell everybody just a slight bit about the Office of Minority Health and Equity. Uh, most of you probably are not familiar with us. Um, but we exist to advocate for uh, those individuals around the state that we consider underserved or underrepresented. And we do this on behalf of demographics that cross ethnic and racial categories, um, individuals who identify as differently abled, and then of course, those who identify as um, LGBTQ. So we're very happy to be doing this. Um, and, and it also happens to coincide that this is Minority Health Month. And so um, as a part of this month, um, we put on as many activities as we can, but we make sure that we create activities and opportunities to engage with those different communities that I just mentioned that we advocate on behalf of. And so that's why we're here today, um, to really talk to this community, to really get a dialogue going back and forth. And um, one of the things that I wanna start with is a statement. Um, um, and that statement is gonna sound really heavy, but we're here to talk about it and to work through this. So I'm just gonna start with the statement and it's that 2022 is poised to become the year of the most anti-LGBTQ legislative actions in the history of our country. Um, as of the end of last month, there were nearly 240 bills with elected officials from around the country promoting measures that seek to limit uh, children's education on LGBTQ issues, and to even restrict transgender kids from accessing gender affirming medical treatment and bathrooms and things like that, that would allow them to match their identity to, uh, to use of space. So because of this focus, Nomi's focus, because of those actions I just mentioned, we developed today's um, event and it's entitled Get Connected. It's a conversation with LGBTQ service providers and LGBTQ youth and also those who identify as LGBTQ, even if you are not identifying as youth. So um, the conversation is gonna allow us to better understand the challenges that the youth are currently facing and to even describe the importance and why service delivery methods really need to embrace intersectionality. Um, but before we get started, I wanna just do a couple of little housekeeping things. Um, it's the world of Zoom that we live in, we have to do this now. Um, we want to just, and I want to start by saying thank you to Dominique Sec. She is the NOMI staff member who has handled the pre-planning for this event, has had to address changes, um, last minute changes, and she's made this an opportunity for all of us to have a safe space to have this dialogue. So thank you um, very much, Dominique. And if we have any IT challenges as we go through this conversation, just drop a note in the chat box and she'll address it. Um, also want to mention that if for any reason, you want to engage the closed captioning feature. If you look at the very bottom of the screen, there's a uh, task bar and you can either do um, the CC tab and you can either show subtitles, you can hide subtitles. And then, as I said, we're gonna talk tonight. And if you wanna ask a question or just make a comment, you can either raise your hand physically or you can use the, um, the option um, along the, the, the bar again to raise your hand virtually, or you can just enter your question in the chat box. Um, and uh, we're gonna be recording this conversation. So please let us know if you're not comfortable with that. Um, we may need to have a conversation offline 
but we hope that you are able to engage in a dialogue that's recorded because we wanna share this message and that dialogue with people who couldn't be here tonight. And then lastly, um, without further ado, I wanna introduce you to tonight's facilitator. Uh, Percy Niaves is a youth resource specialist at the center. Some of you might know him. Um, he graduated from uh, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas in 2021. Um, Percy has a degree in elementary education, and he's been involved with programming at the center since 2018. And one of his most, one of his current activities is he's putting on um, a 2022 LG, LGBTQ youth pride prom. And I think that's going to be happening, Percy, on May 28th, if I'm not mistaken. And so without further ado, Percy, why don't you go ahead and take over uh, the driver's seat, and I'm going to sit back and just take in the conversation. Thank you, Tina. Happy to be here. Happy to see everyone that was able to make it today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so I'm so happy that Nomi has decided to put together this event so that we can share resources that we have both here in Las Vegas and also in Northern Nevada. Um, we mentioned the Q&A at the end. So again, if you have any questions at all during any of our conversations, please feel free to put that in the chat so we can address it at the very end during the Q&A session. All right, so for our panelists here today, go ahead and uh, please let us know your name, pronouns, and what you do at your organization. And this is gonna be not the youth right now, youth, you will have your chance to introduce yourselves a little bit later, but for our adult panelists, go ahead. Hi everyone, um, my name is Stacy Spain. I use she, they pronouns because I'm old and not so interested in performing femininity. Um, I am the program and operations manager at our center in Reno, Nevada, and uh, we are coming up on our sixth anniversary of being a community center for LGBTQIA plus folk um, in the northern part of the state. And our special emphasis in programming is um, youth, senior, and trans uh, folk and supporting their needs across the um, lifespan and in particular, um, helping out our, our youth. That's what I'm engaged in mostly. Hi everyone, happy Friday Eve. My name is Eliza Brunken. I am an LCSW. I am the therapist uh, at the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth. I am so excited to tell you about all of our resources um, at the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth or NPHY for short. Um, we are the most comprehensive service provider for uh, the thousands of young people experiencing homelessness here in uh, Southern Nevada. Um, and so I'm, again, very excited to provide those resources for everyone, including um, other agency providers and our youth. Um, thank you so much for having us here for this very important conversation. Okay, thank you so much, panelists. Let's get into some questions start off with, what does intersectionality mean to you and how do you integrate this concept into service delivery model at your organizations? Whoever wants to start us off with that. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> uh, so for, for us, for me, intersectionality is understanding that there is systemic discrimination due to um, aspects of one's identity. Um, that's including sexual orientation and identity, gender and gender identity, race, economic status, immigration status, national origin and ability, among other um, aspects of one's identity. So understanding that there is that discrimination and knowing that our young people who come in experience these um, in a very um, intersectional way, intersectional way um, affecting all aspects of their lives. Um, how do we integrate this in our service delivery? We are very mindful of this in, in all aspects of our delivery, including providing a um, safe and, and warm environment that's welcoming to, to all our young people that walk in. Um, we continually question how we can improve policies, um, uh, forms of service delivery, including forms and um, creating safe spaces so that way identities are not just just accepted, but also celebrated. So including events and one-on-one um, uh, -on -one direct services and providing linkages to services out in the community. Um, we are very cognizant of, of staff making sure that they're not just competent, but also 
that they are cognizant of the issues that are, are being presented to our young people through these intersectional identities. Um, I, as a therapist, I ensure that I provide strength-based, trauma-informed, and affirming therapy to all the youth who I, I provide services to. And go more into our resources later on when, when we discuss what, what's available. Yes, so start there. <laughs> awesome. Um, here at the center, we understand that every person who walks through the door comes in with a variety of uh, ways that they define themselves. Um, and uh, we are here to welcome every bit of every person who walks through the door. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we like to concentrate on when we think about our volunteers, um, we're an all volunteer um, run organization. I'm the only employee here at our center is that our volunteers uh, represent a broad spectrum of um, all of the kind of uh, folks who are in our rainbow. And that means that, you know, when we have a um, trans mask kid come in, um, they may see a trans mask person behind the counter. And uh, that is huge for these kids to be able to um, see someone who's there helping and who uh, looks, feels, sounds like them and who is going to um, affirm them by being in the same room with them, right? Um, and, and the other thing we need to think about when we think about intersectionality is also intersectionality of need. Um, because our young people who come in here do not just need one thing. We need to think about food insecurity, housing, domestic violence, transportation to the center, all of the um, ways that they may, the, the barriers to service that they may have. It's not just one thing. We can't hand out a bus pass and think we fixed it. Um, so the intersectionality of every bit of who they are um, coming in the door and us thinking about every different way that we can assist them. Those are the two things when I think about intersectionality that um, come to mind for us. Thank you for saying that last bit. Seeing a youth, an LGBTQ youth at that as a whole person is often forgotten. Usually there's only bits and pieces being addressed, but I appreciate you uh, saying the whole being. Um, right. And speaking of barriers, have uh, either of you noticed any impacts that COVID uh, 19 had on youth in particular. Uh, it was, you know, we're still seeing the effects of it now, but in particular during like the time of at its peak. Sure. Um, Alyssa, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, COVID 19, like I said, it is continuing going, but at its peak when um, there were school closures and mitigations and um, uh, created in order to, to be able to help control the spread, you know, um, youth were being isolated and they weren't able to access um, uh, support services. They weren't access, able to go to schools where, you know, a lot of them have, a lot of our, sorry, young people have access to um, affirming support for their natural supports for, you know, um, for a, a number of, of those. Um, we did find, and you've seen the increase in um, mental health needs, um, domestic violence, uh, you know, having youth who are unable to leave homes where it could be uh, dangerous or it could be toxic, where um, they may not be accepted, including other tensions for other various reasons, um, could be you know, dangerous for, 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 sorry, for our youth. Um, for us, one of the, the lessons that we learned um, as an agency was figuring, figuring out how to reach those youth, right? So a lot of our outreach took place in schools and going to assemblies and going to meetings and talking classrooms, but without being able to do that and trying to learn the whole Zoom process and online, you know, taking all of that into account, we were uh, able to consult with our youth ambassadors um, compensated for their services and they helped us figure out, figure out things like what social platforms would be most viable in order to market our services in order to reach uh, those youth who are marginalized who, who don't have the access to services and who are aren't being able to to see that and aren't being able to reach so um, 
We continue to feel the effects. I'm so happy to say we never had to close our doors. Um, you know, even through the, the highest of, of every, every um, Omicron and, and every effect that we were continue to provide service delivery at our drop-in center. We continue to provide ser services for our residential youth um, and, and making sure that our staff and our young people were kept safe and as healthy as possible. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so we actually did close our doors for about six weeks um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, then um, there was a struggle with the pivot, everyone is familiar in education land, um, the pivot to online learning and to um, learning that took place in a kind of a hybrid mode. And, you know, when we think about um, everything that our queer youth are faced with, um, to have the fact that they were being isolated and away from their family of friends um, and their uh, support groups at, at school and here at the center that has had um, you know, a significant um, impact that I think we're gonna see for a while where uh, you know, students didn't have the um, age appropriate um, activities that would have got them through to um, another le developmental level, perhaps, you know, so we're just here now to say, hey, um, you know, what do you need now? And we find we have found that students um, are coming in after school in larger numbers than ever before. Um, and in particular, our uh, junior high age kids come in after school to access our um, art area and to access our library and to just simply hang out in a kind of a open social setting. And that's um, what we find our, our population missed the most. And, you know, um, everyone was impacted by COVID, but I think folks who um, uh, suffer from uh, social isolation and in the queer community itself, uh, it hit us hard. I'm so happy to hear that the middle age, the middle school age youth are, you know, utilizing those resources. Those are so important and make all the difference. Uh, so thank you for both for sharing. Um, next question, uh, what resources currently exist for housing insecure teens? Here in Southern Nevada, again, we are um, considered the most comprehensive service provider for young people experiencing homelessness. Uh, we have a centrally located drop-in center very close to UNLV off of Tropicana, um, where we provide basic needs and services. Those include a warm meal, um, food cards. We do provide bus passes for things like jobs and going to school. Um, we have clothing, hygiene products, access to laundry facilities, a shower, anything that you would need um, for that day. We provide comprehensive case management uh, to help with everything from education to employment, access to identification. Um, we provide linkages to other service providers as necessary. Um, every youth is matched with a case manager who helps and guides them through all, that, all the supportive services. We also operate the Safe Place program here in Southern Nevada. Um, that service is for any youth in crisis up to the age of their 19th birthday. Um, we get so sometimes it's it's hard to try to seek out uh, the drop-in center for the first time, maybe, or again, there could be an event where there is a crisis and a safe place is necessary. So any youth is able to um, access any of our partner locations, which is a Terrible Herbs gas station, any RTC transit, um, bus, a, um, any library, anywhere you see that safe place logo. So you just go in there, uh, the youth just lets them know that they need a safe place and a responder will go there no matter what time of the day it is, no matter what day of the year it is. Um, once we are we are able to meet with the youth, like, again, they do an intake, do that complete needs assessment that, that we were talking about earlier to figure out what those needs are. Um, they, if they need immediate shelter, we do also have our emergency shelter where we accept minors and young people up to the age of their 21st birthday. We then provide them again with basic needs and services. 
uh, match them with their emergency shelter case manager to help them find a stable and safe living situation, whether that's uh, completing a housing assessment to be connected to a transitional living program, uh, reunifying with family, um, chosen family, family of origin um, through mediation or accessing a ticket through Operation Go Home. Uh, so that's a, a couple of those services. We also have several housing programs uh, which are operated through confidential offsite scattered housing programs. Um, and then we do use a housing first model to ensure um, that, that th these critical services are, are provided for our young people. Um, they are then wrapped around with all kinds of services that, that they need, that they want, um, anything to help them achieve all their housing, employment, education, and uh, any other goals that they have. As, you know, our hope is that every young person that is seeking that support and that help, um, that they don't just survive, but that they're able to thrive no matter what um, intersectional identity that they have and no matter what uh, past trauma that they've, they've encountered, we're here to help empower them um, and they are in the driver's seat to be able to access those services. Uh, so yeah, uh, in a nutshell. That is isn't a partnership for homeless youth. I, I think love that's that. a big nutshell. <laughs> yes. um, and so for housing for our center, um, we are not a shelter. So what we do is provide all of the resources that are available in Reno and uh, try to get people connected with what is available, what is here. And that includes places like Our Place. And we're always explaining that our center is different than Our Place. And Our Place is a shelter for uh, women and children. We also connect folks to our Reno Housing Authority, to Project Restart, and um, several other shelters that are available. We understand that there is um, um, a continuum of action that sometimes happens uh, that we call come out and then get out. And sadly, sometimes when um, kids uh, reveal uh, part of their identity to their parents, then they're asked to leave that home. And so if we have um, young people come in, um, we have uh, a small area that offers um, some clothing, some food, some personal care items, everything, a backpacks full of school supplies, everything that they may not have had a chance to grab if they had to leave home suddenly. Um, I think it's really important that uh, young kids who are unhomed know that there's a way through that. So, I mean, sometimes I would share that I'm a, I'm a, foster kid who graduated out of the foster care system. Um, and they look at me and they go, wow, what? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, first person in my family to go to college. Again, you know, uh, kids need to see the, um, the, the ways that they can succeed after this very traumatic time in their lives, that this is um, a short time period. We're gonna help them get through it. We're going to connect them with, again, those wraparound services if, as much as we can, um, and uh, then help them learn uh, to plan what their next steps are. And so we, we have um, kids that uh, come in here unhomed and then you know, the best thing in the world is to see them a couple of months later and they've, they've got some things figured out and they're, you know, starting to, to make choices about their future. But it is um, uh, a sad reality uh, up here in Reno that, you know, when we do the homeless youth count, um, that there are kids out there on the street every night that don't have a place and we don't want to, you know, pretend that's not happening because it absolutely is. So... Yes, and with, with that said, actually, uh, what are gaps that currently exist in providing services for teens? I think one of those biggest gaps is the 18 to 21 year old age range. Um, you know, a lot of our services, you know, they, they sunset at one age or another. And, you know, the, the person who's in that situation, their situation doesn't magically change when they, you know, are 18 years old in one day or, you know, so, so those sorts of transitional ages are tough. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, the, uh, one of the ways to think about addressing that is always, and I was really happy to hear you say, um, you know, housing first, housing has to be first. Right, folks need a place to sleep and something to eat, 
uh, before they can begin to think about everything else that they need to address in their lives? Oh, absolutely. Um, just, just using that model and, and being able to ensure that our youth do have those basic needs and services because, I mean, Maslow's hierarchy of needs that they're not able to to even go to school or even worry about prom or anything that's happening if they're not able to get those basic needs needs met, right? So, and, and our hope is that they continue uh, to thrive um, and, and to, to get to that next part that they wanna do. Um, I would love to see more um, services aimed at, um, uh, at preventative measures for, uh, for homelessness, um, you know, a lot of times we're, we're here and we're providing, but a lot of times it's, it's, it's after the fact. And a lot of the youth um, are also very hard to reach. Another, another aspect of the COVID-19 pandemic was that um, it was hard to reach our youth, right? So it was hard to be able to get, to provide them the services to, to get that, get them um, access to that. Um, and I feel like if we were able to provide the preventative education for, for a lot of these families, and even um, address other things, including providing family counseling, family therapy, easily accessible quality care um, on all accounts, um, that, that it would be very beneficial for, for a, lot of, um, a lot of issues that we're having. Oh, for sure, for sure. I, absolutely, I agree with, with both of what you said. Uh, both of, yes, so much yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, pivoting uh, a little bit, uh, what are some strategies that service providers can employ to better support youth? I think one of the um, biggest things is giving the youth agency um, over the services that you provide in, in ways that make sense. In other words, you know, I'm 57 and um, we're planning our queer prom as well up here. And gosh, you know, th they need to be planning their own prom as much as they possibly can, because what do I know? So, <laughs> so um, and that's a really simple um, idea, but um, the agency for um, youth to tell us what they need instead of us um, coming, coming down with our pronouncements of, we believe that you need this thing. Um, and uh, that also speaks to communication styles too, as well, right? Um, you know, where are they now? They're they're certainly not on Facebook. No one is anymore. Um, you know, and and are they on Twitter? Are they on Instagram? Um, you know, where? How can we connect with them in ways that uh, work with their lives? And I think. Um, those two issues of um, finding the right channels for communicating to them and giving them the agency to be a part of their own solutions um, are important. Yes, I echo that sentiment, Stacey. Empowering them, empowering youth voice, um, meeting them where they're at and allowing for self-determination because, I mean, as adults, they are the experts of themselves. Yes, uh, we cannot pretend to know um, what is best for every single person that walks through the door, and and we don't know. You know, um, we have to be strength based, and we have to empower them and remind them of their amazing resiliency, um, and that we are just a very small blip on their journey. Uh, and whatever we can do for the time that we are privileged to provide that support, we'll do it. But again, they are the drivers in their own seat. Um, on other uh, other aspects too, I, I think it's so important um, as service providers to use their chosen name um, to honor you know pronouns and um, keep our own biases and our own judgments and our own privileges in check when we are um, communicating when everything from creating our environments uh, to again providing those service the service delivery. Um, yeah. I will add one more thing uh, that yes. you brought up earlier, uh, Elisa, uh, your forms, paying attention to if you do have more than two genders on, you know, your forms, is it just male, just female? Are you being inclusive of non-binary and, you know, gender fluid individuals? So paying attention to forms also and making sure there are options available for the youth who are filling these out. And 
also, speaking of intersectionality, um, are all of our forms um, also available in Spanish? Um, you know, uh, we need to, um, again, meet folks where they are and um, we need to make that effort. I think um, here at our center, <clears throat> Of course, any LGBTQ group that wants to meet here meets here for free. Um, and then it is also in our bylaws that any BIPOC group that wants to meet here meets here for free. Um, and uh, that is just the baseline of how we need to operate um, so that people feel welcome and not just welcomed, but um, part of. Yes, and can I also add really quick that I would also uh, very much recommend that we vet our, um, our referrals to community agencies and service providers, um, and we need to ensure that they are welcoming of our LGBTQ young people, of any other um, identities that, that they may hold, because that warm handoff is so important. Once you have that rapport with that youth, we want to keep that, and we want to make sure that they aren't faced with discrimination um, because of a referral that we made that we, you know, for some reason, oh. did not vet. So another thing I, I would like to point out. Yes, thank you. That's very, very important. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, as we know, there are many components to supporting youth, and one of them is self-advocacy. And one of the ways that we can address this are, is through queer student alliances. And can you speak more about that, Stacey? Absolutely. So we started a QSA for Washoe County School District, um, and it is brand new. Um, and we are striving to work with our QSA to to do some programs that the that the uh, members of the QSA identified that they're interested in doing. And that includes our queer prom. It includes um, providing scarletine sex ed, which sex sex ed, which is specific to the LGBTQ um, youth, um, creating a social and emotional support for those students and um, also providing a closed group, professional, small, small group led um, support. So um, the, what the QSA does is provides all of the students who are members of QSAs from any high school and junior high, um, the ability to come here and learn about the history of queerness and learn how they can become advocates for change in their own community, learn how they can, um, you know, join the, uh, the fight for the future of our, um, our nation. And I think in Nevada, we're sitting on a lot of hard work of, from a lot of people over a lot of years. So um, we uh, can be uh, a leader among the states when we look at the legislation that has passed in Nevada. Um, but that doesn't mean that we need to sit down. We need to stand up and help other states. And so the more we can educate our students about that, the, the QSA um, are really, it's, it's the pipeline for leadership for queer kids in, in uh, Washoe County. Absolutely. And there have been studies done, too, that uh, QSAs or GSAs, which is a gender sexuality alliance, having those on campus, it doesn't just benefit the LGBTQ youth, it actually benefits the school as a whole. So even students who don't identify within the LGBTQ community, they benefit from it. Mm -hmm. From it. All right. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing uh, the services that you provide and just your thoughts about what you would like to see and hope to see. Uh, I'm going to pivot now to the youth portion panel of the event. Uh, youth, you do not have to turn on your cameras if you don't want to, but go ahead, please introduce yourselves. Go ahead and share your name, your pronouns, and how old you are. Uh, I know we did this at the beginning, but go ahead one more time, please. Uh, yeah, sure. So again, I'm Nathaniel Tolentino. You, you guys call me Nate, though. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and I am 16 years old, uh, going on 17. Uh, my name is Lynn Nilsson. I am a transgender male, he, him, and I am 17 years old. My name is Wilbur. He, him, I am 14, 
And I'm also a transgender male. All right. Uh, and actually, let me introduce how all of uh, these wonderful youth met. They go to the Qvolution Youth Group, which meets at the center every Tuesday from 4 to 530. I'll put more information in the chat uh, about that group, just so you all have that for your two belt, tool belts. And you can give that out to any LGBTQ youth. Uh, but let's start off. Um, why is it important to use people's pronouns, preferred pronouns? Well, um, so preferred pronouns are a really big thing to a lot of people's identities, I'm pretty sure. Like, you know, um, even with cisgender people, you know, it's very important to, you know, refer to them with the right pronouns. And the same thing applies to um, people who um, identify as a different gender, gender queer, um, you may say. And so just like just affirming their identity with a pronoun is just, it prevents them from doing harmful things to themselves, such as, you know, suicide, self-harm and, and all that stuff. And it's just, it's very important to do that because, you know, things like that are just really big for people. Um, who struggle with um, having parents or maybe family or friends or maybe like peers at school um, who just don't respect their identities and like who they are as the person. And yeah, I'm, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Nate. Yeah. Lynn Wilbur, do either of you have anything to add or did Nate cover it? Uh, Sorry, my bad. <laughs> no, it's all right. When someone uses our correct pronouns, it uh, helps calm our anxieties about being out in the open as who we want to be. It makes us feel accepted. Mm. Yes. Wilbur? It's okay if you yeah, I do feel like I do agree with Nate that like using the correct pronouns is the biggest suicide prevention. Like it really is like the main thing that can help like people just feel. Oh, this is well, a sad day. Oh, well, oh. <laughs> well, well, I think you're cutting out. Can you try that one more time. Uh, you cut off right after uh, you said prevention. Okay, so um. It really is like the biggest thing that can make somebody you feel loved and accepted and comfortable around you. Yes, and I am gonna quickly throw out some statistics. Uh, LGBTQ youth are four times as likely to have suicidal ideation, and it only takes one affirming adult in an LGBTQ youth's lives to save their life, essentially. So it only takes one adult. Yeah, I will say I have gone through that period in life where, you know, I felt like I should end it all. But after I came to the center, it, it, it made, made my life a lot better. And like, along with that, my, my transition has been pretty good so far. And I just, life's been a lot better for me, like ever since that, that day. When, that. when you use our, uh, our correct pronouns, it feel, makes us feel like we can trust you. Yeah, and it also helps us feel like, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting, I'm, oh my god, you can, can continue. And it's good for us to have an older person who we can confide in. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you all. Uh, next question. Uh, it did come up earlier. I believe uh, Tina shared some statistics. Uh, how does anti-LGBTQ legislation make you feel? So the things that we've been seeing in Florida and Texas, for example. I'll go Am first. I... Okay, go ahead. Um, these anti-LGBTQ legislations make me feel really disappointed. Uh, we were on the right track to letting our citizens express themselves freely, but now it seems like we're going backwards. And, and yeah, so what I would say, um, Percy, am I allowed to swear? <laughs> or is this, you know? I, that, that's up to no me. That's a no, no, don't do I, it. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I don't think so though, Nate. Let's, all right, that's all right. Just wanted to know. <laughs> all right, so what I was gonna say was, I just, 
it's extremely sad to just see like these people in power who aren't very accepting of this change, even though it's always sort of been there. It's just that more people are being more vocal about it because, you know, it's becoming a big thing since, you know, a lot of people have been becoming more brave to step out and, you know, express themselves for who they are. And it's a, it's a big thing where like people, uh, Um, sorry, I just, I, I just saw the, the comment. Um, but yeah, you can, um, am I allowed to, an, to answer the question? Um, uh, I'll, like, do we have to wait until the FAQ? Let me, uh, I mean, if you, if you want to address it, then yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you, um, so what's the question you wanted to ask, by the way, Stacey? Oh, I think it was just a comment, actually. I'm looking at it. Go ahead and continue with what you were saying, Nate. Oh, okay, my bad. Okay. Um, so anyways, um, what I was saying was that, like, yeah, just there's, like, like a lot of political figures lately have been, you know, just trying to suppress our our voices about, you know, how we're, like, not afraid anymore to just express ourselves in that sort of way. And yeah, just the, the way it makes you feel is just, it's incredibly stupid, in my opinion. That's like, that's like the worst word I'm going to use, by the way, in this panel. Uh, and it's just, it makes me feel really sad. And I, I really hope that a lot of people um, stand up and, you know, overthrow these sort of powers to, to put um, more, like, more loving and accepting uh, laws in place. Thank you, Nate. Wilbur, did you have anything to add or did they cover it? Yes, I did. Um, seeing all of this really just makes you like feel hopeless. And like, you know, there's people out there who are like willing to fight for you and all that. But like, just seeing it just drains all of like, all of, try not to repeat words, but really just all of your hope and like, all of the like belief that you have that like people are like there for you and like especially at our age like we really are children who should be worrying about like children's stuff like I don't know like the school gossip but really something <laughs> other than like what bathroom we're supposed to be going in or what sports we can or cannot play so it's really just troubling and especially with all the tests and stuff it's really just a whole lot on our on us so it yeah. is true. It, it, it is end of, end of the year. So, you know, things are getting a lot more stressful. Yes, that is well. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, next question. Uh, what's the best thing someone could do or say when you come out to them? Hmm. Oh. Well, I know that I wouldn't really want um, someone to throw a huge party. Uh, about me coming out and announce it to the entire world just straight up but um i would like for them to accept uh, accept me if i came out to them and to not ask if i'm sure this is the right path because nothing is ever really set in stone yeah, and I would say it's very important to, you know, have trust in your child when they're making these statements, because, again, with what we said during the first question that we were, we were answering, it's that, you know, having one affirming adult in your life is enough to change the world for anyone, honestly. But um, to answer the question personally, um, personally, I just, you know, I wasn't able to get the sort of affirmation um, when I first came out, but I do just want to want people to say that, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you and I, I love you no matter what, you know, but that's yeah. it. Nothing too special. <laughs> no, I mean, if it, it can be incredibly empowering to hear those things, Nate, for anyone, but especially for someone who is in the LGBTQ community. Yeah. Yeah. Wilbur. Um, I don't think I have anything like specific specific to like that somebody could say but like anything that would just let me know that like you love me and you're always, always gonna support uh -oh. me and not like oh what surgery are you gonna get or stuff like that just like let me know that you like care for me and that you're gonna be there for me no yes and I I will add on to this just because we do 
um, when I heard this in group, uh, this this answer that one a youth shared, I was like, wow. Um, in response to having someone come out to you, uh, believe them because they've been thinking about it longer than you might think and mm -hmm. longer than you are guessing. They have been thinking about this maybe every single day for years. So believe them when they come out to you. It took Again, me about trust. two to three years to come out to my parents. Mm -hmm. So when your child or your friend comes out to you, they just really want you to support them and not to ask or judge them about their decisions. Basically, don't treat us like demons. Yes. Yeah. A very <laughs> succinct way to put it, Nate. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. Uh, next question. Uh, are LGBTQ role models and representation, uh, is, is that good? Is it good to have LGBTQ representation? Um, it depends on who's representing us and how they act. Personally, I do not think that uh, anyone who's really up in each other's face is a good example. And... Uh, if they're going out there to insult the people who don't support the LGBTQ, then that is definitely not something I would want to represent me. Yeah, and I will say that, um, again, it does depend. And um, personally, I like from a lot of people that I've known and a lot of like, like most like, like scourging through the internet and all that, you know, um, I just, sometimes there's a lot of, bad apples in our society that give us just a little bit of a bad name and I really feel like uh, role models and representatives they're they're not perfect I would say and it's important to understand that they shouldn't be the only people who are representing the community because again the LGBTQ community has community in the name right so I feel like it's sh like everyone should represent it you know not just one person Yes, absolutely. Wilbur? I feel like representation is... Oh, no. Oh, no. So important. Like, if you just, like, see a character and you're like, wow, this person looks like me, they know how I feel, you just feel like you belong. Like, you just feel so much more comfortable after that. Like, you feel like you could really just be yourself because you know that there are people, like, who are like you. Yes, a thousand times yes. Thank you, Wilbur. All right, and last question for the youth. Uh, what are some things that make you feel like you are in a safe space for LGBTQ youth? Um. Okay, so <laughs> this is very niche, I would say. Probably not, but in my school, um, it's, it's a pretty bad place to be um, a part of the LGBTQ community because um, a lot of people throw around, you know, slurs and uh, insults here and there without really thinking much about it. And, you know, just having an, like an area, like, like even like a small little group or whatever, where people understand that that's not okay and that they don't do that without thinking mindlessly. I think that's like the main thing that makes me feel safe. I would definitely feel safe if I did not hear any slant, uh, slander against, uh, uh, the LGBTQ and the community and about transgender individuals. Yeah, especially those people. Like, like sorry, those people. Like, people like me, basically. Um, you know, p transgender uh, people just get a bad rep, like, all the time. And although I can understand the psychology behind it, it's still very unreasonable, in my opinion. And I think it's important to remember that uh, y'all are children still. Uh, I, I believe Wilbur is uh, the one who brought it up where you all have a lot of on your plate, you know, you're growing up and you deserve to have that space to act and feel exactly like any other kid because you have exact 
the exact worries and concerns and, you know, stress that any other kid has. Mm -hmm, definitely. Wilbur, did you have anything to add? I feel like it can make me feel comfortable. Yeah, I feel like something that can make me feel comfortable is like maybe like a small flag or like maybe like just a simple pronoun pin or like using gender neutral language when like you haven't asked for somebody's pronouns. Just small things like that that can really like go a long way, that can make somebody feel comforted. I'm gonna repeat that because I see some individuals writing. So that, that was uh, a rainbow flag, pronoun pins, and gender neutral language when you meet someone who you don't know the pronouns of. Sounds like a good Friday night. <laughs> it does. Sorry. I will add one thing onto that though. Um, when you meet someone who you have never met before, uh, you can be the one to initiate the asking of pronouns. So you can be like, oh, hi, for, for example, hi, I'm Percy, uh, my pronouns are he, him. And then that lets the other person know, oh, this is a safe space. This person knows about pronouns. I feel comfortable and will most likely share my pronouns because- Yeah, and yes. may, may I also comment about that actually? Yes. Okay, so I would do this very often if it weren't for the fact that because of the area that I live in, uh, my, my school and all, it's a very hit or miss sort of question that can both out you and, or like um, out someone else as well, to be honest, because my school is very homophobic. And um, if I were to ask that, I, and, and I actually tried this once. Um, I asked this to like a friend or something and like they looked at me like I just like, like I have gone like, um, green face paint all over me for like like out of the blue um and just they like they didn't know how to answer the question I was like oh crap I done did did a bad you know and that's like my main sort of fear when it comes to asking that question as much as I want to ask it very often that's very valid Nate um I, I think the only difference here is that the some some of the folks participating uh, on this call are service providers. So they're in that position that they want to make the youth who is coming to them for help feel as comfortable as pos possible. So I think in this situation, it, it it's almost more likely that the youth will be will feel safe because they're coming to a service provider for help. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Sorry, mm. I was just talking in general. No, no, it's okay. Um, do any of the youth have anything else to add before we move on to the Q&A? Portion. In a uh, service and medical side, um, it makes a lot of us feel comfortable if the doctor or the service provider initiates the pronoun conversation. So uh, don't be afraid to ask us. We are not dogs. We will not bite. <laughs> that you. implies all dogs bite. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing so much with us today, Lynn, Nate, and Wilbur. Yes. What? Round of applause to Round you. Round of applause. Oh, <laughs> uh, wait, where's that one applause reaction? There it is. Here we go. Yay. There it is. All right. And uh, we'll now open it up to the Q&A portion. Uh, if any of you have any questions, feel free to put that in the chat or just raise your hand if your camera's on and we will... Uh, it, it can be questions to the youth or to the lovely people on our uh, adult panel as well. And, and Percy, I see that Nate um, wrote something maybe 30 minutes ago that um, Nate might want to Pardon? Oh. Nate, did you want to share? Oh, uh, sorry. I, I was just asking uh, what Dominique was, was saying. Yes. Did you want to read out what you put in the chat earlier? Oh, oh yeah, of course. Of course. Um, what I was saying was that um, it was during uh, Stacy's um, thing about the, about the, the pandemic. Um, even though the pandemic was really bad with, with um, isolation and uh, like cutting off from contact and all that, um, a lot of trans kids, especially myself, have found like a lot of comfort in not having to um, go through social interaction in person. Because um, I remember I am uh, I was like first socially transitioning in my freshman year, I think. Um, actually, it was more in my eighth grade 
year, but it's all right. Um, and just like that sort of barrier where I didn't have to turn on my camera and didn't have to speak at all was um, very secure for me. And I didn't have to worry too much about being judged or being made fun of, all that stuff. And not to mention uh, the masks that we wear to prevent the spread of COVID and all that. Um, it's very good at hiding your facial features. And because I'm very insecure about the way my face looks, because a lot of people who tend to meet me are like, oh, I didn't think your face looked like that. Like, um, and I, I don't blame them. I can't believe it either. Um, and just, you know, just masks covering myself up um, is, is very helpful in preventing gender dysphoria and it also boosts in like adding a bit of um, ambiguousness to your appearance. So people can't really tell if you're male, female or <laughs> any of that sort, you know? That's it's a, all it's I a really say. great uh, comment, Nate. Um, I think that idea of having a, a short time out and, and that the timing worked for you when you were uh, doing that first layer of transitioning, um, yeah, that, that must have felt great. Um, but then we come back into the world. So then we want you to feel um, really welcome and at home here with all of us as well. Yeah, of course. And it's really working, trust me. Good. <laughs> Did we get any questions for? No, I don't see anything else. Just um, Mario who had to jump off saying thank you. And it was, uh, he's grateful to hear from all of you on the panel. I think we did get a question at the beginning during introductions from Stephen. Um, I don't know if you were serious in asking that question, Stephen, but this is a topical conversation point. And maybe you wanna actually ask someone to answer. Actually, I think you covered it. Uh, I was uh, learned a lot about pronouns, and I had never really addressed, or never actually heard it. It's just sure. recently I've actually seen people with pronouns after their name, and I'm like, I'm miffed, um, <laughs> and I'm not quite sure. I, I guess you would have to be in the right situation before you would use them. I mean, I'm not going to go out to some meeting and just say, my name is Steven, I'm he, it, him. <laughs> I think, I think Steven, part of that um, is really not about, you know, you feeling insecure or really secure in your masculinity and how you present as a male, right? Yeah. It right. is, it is you as a person saying, hey, these are my pronouns. And that opens the door up for anyone else to be, to feel more comfortable sharing theirs. And so I, you know, I'm 57, right? All right. Um, and, and so, you know, I grew up in a time where um, we use different words for a lot of things. Yeah. Um, when I was growing up, yeah. um, we used butch and femme. That was the, that was the sure. uh, way that we bifurcated um, our community. And we don't use that so much anymore. Um, and and uh, so it behooves us to continue to stay educated with um, what how folks are identifying and 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 the language they want to feel comfortable using. And it doesn't negate the language we use for ourselves to label ourselves earlier, but we just have to continue growing and and yeah. continue to right. say, hey, you know, uh, this this is what's happening now. Um, and, and, uh, I want to be supportive of, um, everybody as they come up. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you all for, uh, trying for adapting to, uh, our, uh, <laughs> our way of using words. Yeah. Language is continuously and constantly changing. That's why we update the dictionary every year. Yep. Much like being culturally competent. Um, it's not, you know, you don't take one course in cultural competency and then you're done. It's an ever changing um, dynamic and it's a journey. 
And uh, it's one that we should take, you know, willingly and proactively. And it's conversations like this that help keep us abreast about those changes. And the only other thing that I would add, just listening to everyone share their stories and their remarks is that it's a personal choice, right? I have to defer to your opinion. It is your personal choice is the power, the power is yours. And it's not for me to tell you how to identify because it's 2022 or 2010. That's not the way it works. I defer to you, I give you the power. And so um, I just think that again, this evolution and having conversations like this is how we stay current. Mm -hmm. And I just loved, I have never heard the use of pronouns explained the way it was explained tonight about how empowering it is. Um, so I really appreciated that part of the conversation most. I would like to echo Tina for a moment as well and just say that it takes a lot of courage to anybody to speak. So to the youth especially, I am very grateful for you to take this time and opportunity. One of the most exciting things is also one of the most scary things, in my opinion, about being a minority and is that we have um, to bring about the change and the hope that we wanna see. And we have to educate people. Uh, just as Tina has mentioned, we need to help educate people to become more culturally uh, competent. Uh, sometimes it's very frustrating to be a minority of any group that you feel you may wish you didn't have to explain these things, but the truth is explaining them brings so much power. So thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, I recently participated as well in an event on base uh, where we wrangled together some openly gay military service members who spoke at an event. And it's just, it's very powerful to come and bring that education. So thank you, I just wanted to say that. And additionally, uh, not quite related to you folks yet, but it is pretty exciting. The military has recently allowed the use of pronouns in our email signatures. So that was incredibly empowering to all of our uh, LGBTQ uh, service members. Uh, and uh, a lot of folks have begun to adapt that in their email signature. So um, without having these types of conversations where we're willing to be vulnerable, we're not gonna begin to see the changes that we need. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, thank you, Daniel. We all need to be the change we want to create in the world. Um, when, Get comfortable uh, being uncomfortable too. Uh, you know, it's as long as much as education and experience we all have. It's so good to stretch and be able to uh, to be the best that we can be, so that we can provide those services to to those that need them. And um, I encourage you know uh, that if we are wanting to find more information, that there's some great resources out there. The center is great um, here in Southern Nevada, that there's online national organizations, Trevor Project, there is uh, True Colors United, all kinds of great places to access these resources so that we can take it upon ourselves to be uh, the best service providers that we can. I work with the youth uh, every day and they teach me stuff every week. I don't know if y'all know that. I, I am the, one of the facilitators for Qvolution, but they are constantly teaching me things. So. Like memes. Yay. And, and change. I think there's this, I don't know if anybody watches the TV show. It's uh, at one of the streaming stations. It's um, um, Ted Lasso. And he talks about change. And he says, change is like riding a horse. If it feels good, you're not doing it right. So... <laughs> <laughs> And you have to think about that for a minute, but then it resonates, doesn't it? It's like, oh, yeah, because um, I'm looking at something that Percy wrote about um, allies being welcome in some of the um, conversations that we're talking about. And that's where the change happens. You have to be a little uncomfortable sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's OK. We, we so run away from being uncomfortable, don't we? You want life to always feel natural and comfortable. And as an ally, we have to be able to step outside that in order to grow. And it, it's the, the, the dividends and the payout is tremendous. So, um, you know, I really am a big advocate of bringing people along um, because when you do that and that ally then is just gonna help, you know, help with 
relaying messages to others who may not normally be a part of the conversation. It's like, you know, I'm gonna go back to like grade school math or something like concentric circles. Remember, if you have enough circles that come together, you know, the far outlying circles that you may never touch, they will get the message because of that connectivity, you know, it just keeps growing. And that's what an ally can do. And that's why we love having these kind of conversations. And it's a privilege to be able to be a part of these conversations. But again, if, if you feel comfortable, you're probably not doing it right. Um, I do want to point out that Lynn had one last comment, it looks like, in the chat. Did, Lynn, did you want to read, or read it yourself, or do you want me to read it? Do it. Um, the world is changing and evolving every second. Uh, we cannot be ignorant to the newest developments, especially when it comes to interacting with the newest generations. Um, if we want to understand the younger people, we have to be able to have conversations with them and understand them. And it's hard to do when we're not stepping out of our comfort zone to learn. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. All right, if, I, if it, no one has any other questions, uh, do, or do, are there any last comments or questions before I start wrapping things up? No. All right. I just want to see. Oh, oh no, I'm so oh, sorry. Oh God, go that was so okay. That was so late. I'm so sorry. Okay. What I was gonna say was, um, thank you so much for inviting us to this panel. Um, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry if I messed anything up. By the way, just wanted to point that out. Don't apologize. Um, wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and I was feeling very nervous before this, but I'm. I'm glad that we got it all out and you know everything is all sorted out. That's it. Thank you, Nate. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for your, your time and like your attention to us. Like it really means a lot that like people from other generations really like wanted to hear about like how we feel and stuff. It means a lot. Yes, Wilbur. See now I'm 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 not saying I'm getting emotional, but I'm feeling very parental, I guess, because I'm hearing a statement that was made several times about you you are young people, you're not adults. You know, like if I was there, I'd probably be hugging on you right now. So, you know, you are young adults and you need to be in a spaces where you're affirmed. And um yeah, it just feels real good to give you this opportunity. And I just, again, I can't emphasize how this recording needs to be promoted. We need to share this tape, this, you know, even if you just cut it up and just share, you know, the testimonial components, or I don't know, but this conversation needs to not stay in this space. It was really, really powerful. And um, I guess I'll just, Percy, I can take it from here and kind of wrap us up if that's okay. If everybody's okay, we'll we're going to ask a couple of poll questions um, because we do this so that we can continue to do make content like this and make it relevant and, and, and useful for people. And Dominique, if you want to pull that first poll question up, um, it has to do with um, asking Oops. about the. Uh -oh. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. No, if you want to go ahead and pull it up. It says that I'm logged into another device, and I'm wondering if it's because there's other co-hosts in here. Let me see. Hold on. But go ahead, Tina. Sorry. Um, can we can we roll the, the the poll? It's saying an error now, and I'm not understanding why. Um, maybe okay. not. Yeah. Okay. Well, if we don't have the polls, the poll is on our screens. I can see it. Oh, you? Oh, I think I just can't. Maybe because I'm a host or something. Okay. Um. Well, the first poll question is just about what aspects of the webinar did you enjoy most. And you can check all that apply. And again, we ask that question because we want to make content and present it in a way that's going to be meaningful for those who give up their time to either be a panelist or to be a participant. So it really does mean a lot if you could answer those questions for us. And so I guess if I can't see the questions, I'm not going to be able to see the results either. So. <laughs> 
I can't tell if it's going or not going. Uh, the results are being shared. So we had for poll question one, since apparently Zoom wanted to let me share today. <laughs> uh, what aspect of this webinar did you most enjoy? Check all that apply. And five out of six individuals said panel service provider. Uh, everybody said youth testimonies and 50% set the question and answer section. And then for question two, what would you like to know more about check all that applied? 50% um, said policy and legislation, 17% uh, said community outreach strategies, 83% said programs for LGBTQ youth, 50% said resources for LGBTQ youth, 67% said programs for parents slash guardians of LGBTQ youth, and 50% said resources for parents, guardians of LGBTQ youth. And everyone that answered the poll should be able to see the results of the poll on their screen. Thank you, Alex. And that last question is intentional as well. Um, we ask questions like that because when we have these kind of gatherings, we like to try and identify actionable next steps. And this gives us a lot of information. We're coming up on a legislative session here in the state of Nevada. And uh, for example, my advisory committee um, for the Office of Minority Health and Equity, our legislative advisor is Patricia Spearman and she's an open, openly gay woman. Um, she's a champion for LGBTQ issues and she is just a well-rounded, dynamic go-getter if ever you have met one. And if we were to bring topics of importance that we heard about today to her attention, it could very easily become something that she wants to somehow manifest into some type of a legislative action. So that's why we ask these kind of questions. Everything that we do is we try to be intentional with the information you share with us. So thank you for that. Um, so those are just the poll questions. Um, you know, some of the other things that I heard um, very, very resolutely was um, the safe place logo. I want to make sure that everybody on this call knows what that looks like and how to identify it and how to utilize it if you need to. And I think uh, Dominique did put a link to the website that would feature what it looks like. I was trying to um, plug in an image and I'm just technologically <laughs> not advanced enough. I couldn't share the, logo, the, the image, but if you go to the link, I know it's there. And then also um, kudos to Washoe County having a, a QSA. Kudos, 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 because one of the things we talked about as we were preparing for this, this session was about isolation and about how um, detrimental it can be. And, you know, we often are concerned about um, more marginalized communities having safe spaces in either our northernmost regions or our frontier communities. And so QSAs really do serve a purpose. So kudos to you and, and hopefully it's supported and we'd love to hear that. Um, the other thing that I heard that I mentioned at the beginning of my closing remarks was about that one affirming person or adult can make a difference in your life, you know, and I just hope that everybody on this call and that anybody who ultimately listens to this has that person in their life. And if they don't, these resource providers can be that. They can help you identify that if you don't have it present, presently. Um, and I know that, you know, some folks actually talked about having some suicidal ideations and you know, we want to make sure that that ideation does not get acted on. We just do not. And um, the last thing that I heard that was kind of, I guess, um, thematic was that our representation is not good representation. You know, that role models have to be, you know, you have to earn the status of role model, I think, you know, and that we should not emulate just anyone who self labels as a role model, right? That we should elevate and amplify people who really do a service to the community. So I thought that was pretty strong. And then the last thing I wrote is just allow LGBTQ youth just to be youth. You know, some days you wanna just be a kid, right? Not a kid who identifies as. And so um, that was the last thing that I heard just to wrap up. And um, um, I think that that was a great way to uh, end this dialogue and this conversation. Um, we are so grateful that you gave us this time. Um, Percy, you were amazing. Thank you for filling in like you did. 
Um, our, our resource specialists, you guys, you answered every question, you gave good information. And then to our youth, you guys rock. So um, I don't have anything else, Dominique. Do we need to do anything else or say anything else other um, than goodbye? I was just gonna say just thank you to everyone who attended and to Stacy, uh, Eliza, did I pronounce it right? You just correct, okay. And Percy and um, just all of you who are attending and helping and Percy, of course, stepping in at the very last minute. Thank you so much. Everyone, please enjoy your evening. Or somebody said your Friday Eve evening. Percy's the MVP. Absolutely, absolutely. Came absolutely. in in a clutch, came in in a clutch and hit it out the park. <laughs> thank you, happy to be here, happy to do this. Thank you all for coming again. Yeah, thank you thank everyone. You. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. I learned thank a lot. You.